Samuel. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and find your place in the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17, and uh, we're going to kind of go back to chapter 16 as well, but we'll key in on verses 3 through 7 to give us a place to jump off from, and then we'll just kind of fill in the gaps as we go. Today, today is, uh, is uh, the Super Bowl. Now, some of you don't give a rip about it. Can I hear you? Some of you don't care. Can I, can I, can I hear you? If you don't care today, I want to hear you. All right, there's several of you that don't care. All right, so humor me, all right? Will you just humor me? How many Patriots fans do I have in the house? Okay, let me back up in that. Let me, let me ask that another way. How many people are pulling for the Patriots today? Let me hear you. <laughs> All right. So, how many of you then are pulling for the Eagles today? You know, as a pastor, sometimes you don't know what to do and how to be. You want to kind of some, sometimes stay neutral. The Dallas Cowboys on my team, and I don't apologize for that. Now, I will say this, David and Hal and Harold and Nancy and whoever else has got a uh, Pittsburgh Steelers shirt on. When I was just a, calm down, calm down. When I was just a tiny, tiny, tiny little kid, somebody bought me uh, a Pittsburgh Steelers jersey. And I flirted with the idea of being a fan for about two or three days. And then I went back to the Cowboys. To the Cowboys. Come on, God's team. The Cowboys are God's team, and one day God's going to favor them, and they're going to win a game. I don't know when that is going to be. So I, I thought, what am I going to wear today? Because I don't really like the Patriots. I'm sorry, guys. I love you, but I don't like the Patriots. I, I'm not a big Tom Brady fan. I realize that he is the greatest quarterback that's ever played the game. There's no doubt about that. I, I, don't, I don't argue that fact. But I don't like him necessarily. I don't like, the, I don't like the Patriots. I'm not an Eagles fan either because they're in our division. I'm not an Eagles fan either. But I will say that there is a guy who's playing quarterback now for the Eagles. Y'all know who I'm talking about? Nick Foles. He's a student at Liberty University. He's an online student, and when he gets done, he feels a call on his life to be a pastor. So I, I understand that there's a lot of Patriots fans in the house, and, and I, I, you know, I wasn't sure what I was going to do today, so I thought I would uh, just try to fill, fill you guys out. So um, I bought two shirts. I bought a, uh, thanks to Wilkes Dugout, by the way, check him out. That's Scott, he's a friend of mine. And uh, this is a Patriots shirt. Can you tell? Can you tell? Somebody come up here and stand and hold this for me real quick. Come here, Ben, quick, quick, quick. All right, I need uh, somebody else to come up here. To Tim, come up here, Tim. No, <laughs> he didn't want to hold that one. You, all right, so, so then I've got another one. Okay, that's all right. Come on up here, Tim. Come on, man. Turn around. You like the, you like the Eagles? You're a pa- all right, switch, switch, because Ben's about to die over there holding a Patriots jersey. So, so you know, I, I thought, well, I'll go ahead and get both of them, and then I'll have to make a decision, and I want you to help me make the, the decision. So how many of you think that I ought to pull for the Patriots today? How many of you think that I ought to pull for the Eagles today? How many of you don't care? <laughs> all right, so here's the deal. I don't know about you, but... I like a good underdog story. You know, today I'm preaching on David and Goliath, and, and David was the underdog. He's about 15 years of age, and Goliath is standing nearly 10 feet tall. So everybody expected uh, can, Goliath, the evil, wicked one. Everybody expected Goliath to win the battle. But David was the underdog, so I kind of decided that today I'm going to go with. (laughs) Give it up for the Eagles! Uh, Thanks, guys. Hey, let me have those shirts. You can't have that. Hey. Give that to Austin. We'll give those away right after the service is over with as well. All right? Hey, guys, I'm going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17 today, and we are talking about uh, the underdog. And I'm going to be speaking to you today on the story of David and Goliath. Now, 
If you have ever been in church a day in your life, if you've ever been to a vacation Bible school, if you've ever read a book or uh, been friends with somebody who was in church, you've probably heard the story of David and Goliath. So I'm not going to go back and, and build this up too much. I want to jump right in. But I do want you to understand that in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 3 through 7, it says this, and we're going to jump off right here. Look what it says. The Bible says in verse 3, Then the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. So here you got Goliath and all the Philistine soldiers, and then you've got on this side, you've got the Israelites and all of their soldiers, and really they're shaking in their boots because they look over there and they see a 10-foot giant. Let's read on. Then the champion came, verse 4, then the champion came from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, somewhere around nine feet, six, eight inches tall. He was a giant. Then the champion came out from the armies of the Philistines. That's what I just read, verse 5. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and bronze, a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. I want you to get the picture. Here you've got a man that's probably weighing around five to 600 pounds. Now that's before the armor. Add the armor onto him, it's probably another 150 or 200, maybe 250 pounds on top of that. Here you have the Andre the Giant. Anybody remember him? All the old people. All right, so, so you got the Andre the Giant of biblical times. This man was a physical specimen. He was a giant among giants. You know, every one of us, every single one of us, will face giants in our lives. Now, he may not be 10 feet tall, but he may feel and look taller than that to you. Now, what are your giants? I mean, think about it. What are your giants? Well, your giant could be an addiction. Your giant could be alcoholism or pornography or drugs or your finances or relationships. I don't know what your giants are. I don't know what they are in your life, but the fact of the matter is every one of us at some time or another in our lives, we're going to face some giants in our lives. How many of you agree, agree with that? Would you nod your head? You agree with that? Some of you right now are facing them. Some of you will face them next week. Some of you pay, face them this last week. So I want to talk to you about facing your giants as I speak today on the subject, the underdog. Now, just to give you a little context before we jump into some truths I find in the scripture, if you'll back up to chapter 16, you're going to read about how David was anointed as the king of Israel. If you go back a few more chapters, what you decide or you discover is that the people of Israel told God, God, we want a king. We want a king. Everybody else has got a king. We want a king. God said, that's not wise. Allow the prophets to lead you through the word of God. No, we want a king. We want a king. And so God said, okay, I'm going to give you what you want. He gave them Saul. Now, Saul started off pretty good, but then Saul turned bad, and he didn't end so well. And then they were about ready to anoint another king. And so they went to this little town, and they went to Jesse's house because God said, the next king is going to be one of Jesse's sons. I think Jesse had eight sons, and so all of the sons were there in the house except for one. He was out in the fields with the flocks, and, and uh, Samuel came to anoint the king, and Samuel said, oh, no, this is not the one. He's not the one. He's not the one. He's not the one. Oh, no, he's not the one. He's not the one. And he got to the very last one, the seventh. He said, do you have any more sons? He said, well, yeah, but you don't want him. I mean, he's the run of the liver, of the, of the litter. He's, a, he's the little bitty kid, you know. He, he's the one, you, you don't want, you know, his name's David, and he's out with the flock. You don't want him. 
Can I remind you what the Bible says in chapter 16, verse 7? But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his height or his stature because, uh, because I have rejected him for God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Aren't you glad about that? He said, I want to see David. And he came in and David was the man. And he anointed him to be king. So that's where we were up to this point. And then verse chapter 17. Our text. Let me share with you five things. I want you to write these five things down. As we think about this story, the underdog, there are some truths that I find in this passage that all of us need to be made aware of. Number one, write this down. Number one, don't miss the thing that leads to the thing God has for you. What? Let me say it again. Don't miss the thing that leads to the thing God has for you. You. What do you mean, Pastor? Go with me to chapter 17 and uh, verse 17 and verse 18. The Bible says there, Then Jesse said to David, Jesse is David's dad, his son, Take now for your brothers an ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. Bring also these ten cups of cheese to the commander of their thousand And look into the welfare of your brothers and bring back news of them. Now, here's what's happening in this passage. David is told by his dad, Jesse, I want you to go down to the battle. You know where the Philistines and and your brothers are and they're going to fight each other. And I want you to go and serve them and bring some food to them. Now, guys, listen to me. We have to go through the process before we get to the promise. Before you can be great, before you can ever be a leader, before you can do something awesome, you've got to be willing to serve. Man, I know a lot of people, they want to be great, they want to be leaders, they want to be the big dog, and yet they are too good to serve. You'll never be the big dog, you'll never be great in the eyes of God, you'll never be able to do anything great for God until you're first of all willing to serve. While we put so much emphasis on serving here at Soul Quest Church, David served lunch to his brothers before he was great. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. The Bible says, despise not the day of small beginnings. The Bible says, be faithful over the few things and I will put you in charge over many things. You see, David went from a gopher to a gladiator. But he had to be willing, watch this, but he had to be willing to serve first. Don't miss the thing that leads to the thing God has for you. Well, Pastor Ronnie, I, I just want you to know that I just uh, feel like that uh, this job is below me I'm doing. I I want you to understand, Pastor, I I really thought that I would be further along than I am right now. Can I just be really nice and say, shut up. Guys, listen, God uses the process in our life to get us to the promise. You are where you are because it is God's design for you to be where you are right now. Don't give up. Keep on serving. Keep on loving. Keep on living. Keep on doing what God has called you to do. And one day, those doors are going to spread wide open. And when they do, then you have enough faith and courage and boldness in Christ to walk through them. Amen? Don't miss the thing that leads to the thing that God has for you. God uses the process in our life to get us to the promise. Here we have David. I mean, David has already been anointed as king. And he's a servant boy. He's the king, man. He's 15 years of age, and he's already been anointed the king. And he's serving his brothers and the other soldiers bread and cheese. Come on, man. But he was willing to go through the process to get him to the promise. Some of you are frustrated right now in your life. You're really frustrated at where you are. Put your head down. Keep on living. Keep on serving. Keep on loving. 
Keep on being faithful to God and let God open the doors and when he does, walk through them. Number two, write this down. Number two, as we're thinking about the underdog, don't miss the thing that leads to the thing God has for you. But number two, expect critics. <laughs> expect critics. People are, you're always, you're always going to have critics. There's always going to be critics. I guarantee you. Listen, I've been in the ministry for 20, full time for over 26 years now, almost 26 years, I guess. And uh, I've experienced a whole lot of them. And many of them come from within, not from without. You see, look in verse 28 with me. Verse 28, let's read down through verse 30. The Bible says, now Eliab, his oldest brother, he's the first critic, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David and said, watch this, this is interesting, why have you come down? Hey, runt brother, why in the world are you here? You, you don't have any business being here. You can't do anything. Go home and tend your little sheepies. You ever had a sibling talk to you like that? Go home. Get out of here. Why have you come down here? And with whom you have left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. I know that you haven't come down to do anything good. You just want to be nosy. Sound like a conversation with your brother or sister, doesn't it? But David said, what have I done now? What have I done now? Was it not just a question? Verse 30, then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing, and the people answered the same thing as before. And then look over in uh, verse 33, the Bible says, Then Saul, he's the king, then Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth while he has been a warrior from his youth. Now jump over to verse 43. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? This is an insult to me. I'm 10 feet tall. Man, I weigh 600 pounds. You're bringing this little runt child over here to fight me? This is, there's no way that he has a chance to defeat me. So here you have it. The first criticism came from his brother. The second criticism came from other people. You know, have you ever noticed when somebody starts criticizing you, other people start to pile on? You ever experienced that? They may not know you, but they're going to pile on. That's what happened here. Then the third came from Saul, the king. Then the fourth came from Goliath. Listen, it's not just Goliath you got to fight. Sometimes you got to fight those that are close to you. Often our greatest pains come from our greatest loves. You ever had somebody tell you, you can't whoop this giant? You'll never beat that addiction. You, you'll, you'll never make it past. You'll never get out of debt. You'll be in bondage, in debt all of your life. It never gets any better. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. Can I just say to you, you, you and I cannot whip the devil with just excitement and hoopla. I, boy, I love coming to the house of God, and I, I, I'm a passionate guy. I, I love to get excited. Listen, if you can't get passionate about Jesus, then you got a problem anyway, right? As a child. But I love, people say, well, you need to calm me down a little bit. I can't. I, I just can't calm down. I mean, Jesus Christ saved me from my sins. Praise God. Hallelujah. Woo! I can't calm down. I mean, I, I just, I, ca I can't calm down. People say, man, you just can't do it. You can't do it. You can do it. I, listen, I love when we come to the house of God and we clap and we laugh and we, we holler and we, we hoop and holler and we have a good time. We believe that church ought to be fun. We don't think that church ought to be boring. If, boring, if your church is boring, it's not God's fault. It's somebody else's. I mean, we, we, we sing, we raise our hands, we clap our hands. I mean, we shout. I mean, some of you, I look back and you're doing a little, dig, a little jig, a little Baptocostal something, you know. You're terrible. It looks awful, but you're getting all excited. Can I just tell you, listen to me. That stuff, listen to me, that stuff will not defeat your giant. I love it. But you know what's going to defeat your giant? 
What's going to defeat your giant is when you make a decision. Everybody say decision. You're going to understand it in a moment. Do you know that Jesus won? Really not at Golgotha. You know where Jesus won? He won at Gethsemane. Do you know the difference? Golgotha is the place called the place of the skull. Golgotha is where Jesus died on the cross. He said, well, that's heresy. I can't believe you would say that. We say, well, where, where's Gethsemane? It's the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was, was, was really struggling with the will of God. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but in his humanity, because remember, Jesus was God and man. Not half and half, 100% God and 100% man. You say, explain that. I don't have time, but here's the deal. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's down on his face before a holy God, and he's praying and praying and praying and praying and praying so earnestly and so fervently that, that his sweat was coming out of his pores like blood. The capillaries behind his skin were, were exploding and bursting, and blood was flowing through his pores. And then he finally came to the place, and he said, Oh, God. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, Jesus was saying, God, if it's possible, can you redeem the world another way? But do you remember what he said next? Then he made a decision. He made a decision. He said, but God, not my will, but yours be done. You see, Jesus decided. You say, well, what do you mean? He decided in, in the Garden of Gethsemane that he was going to go on and do what he did because he could have called 10,000 angels to take him off the cross. He's God. Well, they couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't get free. He's God. Well, I mean, they had him in, in a jail and they was beating him. He's God. But he made a decision in Gethsemane. He said, not my will, but yours be done. Guys, we're going to have critics, but we've got to decide. Listen to this. We've got to decide it's worth it to fight the giant. Some people like to keep their giant as a pet. Man, do you want to you be freed? Oh, yeah, I want to be freed. Well, kind of, sort of. Guys, you got to make, we've got to make, I don't know what your, I don't know what your giant is, but you got to make a decision today. I, I'm tired of this thing taking my life and ruling my life. I'm tired of this addiction. I'm tired of this pain. I'm tired of being in financial ruins. I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. Well, you got to make a decision. There comes a time, like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, you got to kneel before God and say, God, it's worth it. I am going to fight. But until then, you're not going to win. Don't miss the thing that leads to the thing God has for you. Number two, expect critics. Expect critics. Expect. I want you to turn to somebody right now and say, I'm going to win this thing. Come on, say it right now. I'm going to win this thing. Come on, I'm going to defeat this giant. Say it. I'm going to defeat this giant. Yeah, we're all going to have critics. We've got to make up our mind. Number three, write this down, number three. Number three, you cannot win by yourself. You cannot win by yourself. Verses 43 through 45. Let's look at it together. The Bible says, Then the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you would come to me with sticks? And the Philistine calls David, um, cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the air. I love what David said. And then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But, but, but. Everybody say, but. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. Guys, listen to me. We can't win this battle by ourselves. But greater, greater, greater is he who is in the child of God than he that's in the world. I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot win. You can't win. By yourself. You cannot win by yourself. You know what 
David had some confidence, didn't he? Do was a little cocky. Wasn't he? 15 years of age. I can see why his brothers are a little bit like, come on, man, get out of here. David was confident. Why was he confident? Let me tell you why he was confident. Because he'd battled before. Well, had he, had he, battled, had he battled a giant? No, but he battled a bear. He battled a bear. He battled a lion. You say, what do you find that? Verses 34 and verse 35. The Bible says, but David said to Saul, your serpent, your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. And I went after him. He went after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. This is a bad dude. He was confident in what he could do because God had used him in the past to do something else. I want you to listen to me really, really, really closely. Watch this. Are you listening? Say, I'm listening. God always uses your abilities and your past circumstances. Listen, sometimes we need to stop belly aching. I don't understand why I had to go through that. God, why me? Why me, God? Why me? Why couldn't I have been raised by a pastor's, uh, been a pastor's kid or a devoted Christian man and wife's kid? Why, why, do I ha- why did I have to be raised like I was raised? Why did I have to be, uh, uh, go through all this stuff? Maybe you were abused. I don't know. Maybe physically, mentally. Or even sexually. Why, God, why? Can I tell you something? Let me tell you why. Because there's, if you'll just grow through this thing, there's going to be people that you can reach and you can minister to that I never, ever will be able to. God uses our past circumstances. When we walk with God on a daily basis, we have confidence in what God can do because God has already done it. Man, I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you're going through. And I'm not minimizing your problem. I'm tell- I don't know what your giant is. I don't know what's attacking you. I-, I really don't. And I'm not minimizing it today, but I'm just telling you, listen to me, friend. Listen to me. God wants to take it and use it. Nothing, nothing is wasted. Nothing. Number four, to win. To win, you must attack your giant. Everybody say attack. We got a lot of... You know, passive people in the church today. But if you want to win, you got to attack. You got to attack. You got to attack the giant. Look in verse 48. The Bible says in verse 48, then David said to the Philistine, You come to me. Well, excuse me, back up. Verse 48. Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to David to meet David, that David, I love this, ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. Here comes a giant, man, coming after David, and David runs towards him. Now, can I just be honest? You say, well, no, don't lie to me. All right, I'll be honest with you. Here's what I would do. Y'all remember back in the day when you were young and you played, uh, you know, uh, tag or whatever, and you, 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 know, you did all the moves and stuff, and nobody could ever catch you, and you, were, you thought you were the best. You were the next Barry Sanders, you know, and you did all this stuff. You, you know what I'd have done? I'd have run up to him and dodged him and pulled around and go. Rah! David didn't do that. I think I saw a movie where somebody did that one time. Anyway. Squirrel. But David, David, the Bible says, attacked. He ran towards him. Now, Goliath, in verse 25, it says, Goliath is now coming into their turf, onto their turf. I mean, before it was Goliath up on top of the hill. Here's the valley. Here's the Israeli army. And the Bible says in verse, uh, in verse uh, 20, I think 25, it says, Goliath started coming down the hill. And then David runs towards him, right at him. He attacks his giant. Listen, friend, you don't run from giants. You attack giants. Let me ask you a question. How do you deal with a copperhead? Well, oh, I know because I, I, I don't like to kill anything. 
I, if I find a copperhead in my yard, I'm going to pick up the, I'm going to get a stick and I'm going to put him in a plastic tub and then I'm going to bring him to the edge of town and I'm going to take him out. No, he's going to bite you! You say, how, how, do you, how do you take care? How do you deal with the cop? You cut his freaking head off. The Bible says that he ran at him. He ran at him, verse 48. He ran at him. But guys, listen, I want you to listen to me and listen to me close. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know if it's an addiction in your life. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's uh, pornography. Maybe it's uh, financial problems and bad mistakes and relationships. Or maybe it's your health. I, I don't know what you're dealing with, but here, I want you to listen to me. We need to stop rationalizing. It's not a pet. We need to stop hiding it. We need to bring it out of the shadows and bring it into the light of God. We need to admit that we have a problem. We want to call it everything, under. The, well, I made a mistake. No, you didn't. You sinned. I sinned. I mean, we, we, I mean, I know that's not politically correct. But guys, listen, we need to start calling these giants in our lives what they really are. And if we're going to move past it, if we're going to kill the giant, man, the first thing we have to do is we've got to attack it. We've got to decide that we're not going to blame everybody else under the sun for what we did. And we're going to claim it, and we're going to say, God, this is me standing in the need of prayer. Man, I, I'm, I've never seen anything like it. We, we played the blame game. Well, it's everybody else's fault. Where I'll, The question I always have is, if the same thing is happening in all these different relationships, there's a common denominator. You. Well, if I wasn't raised the way I was raised, guys, if you're going to keep doing that, you're going to keep that cycle going on from your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents. It's going to go on forever. you got to stop it in Jesus' name. We gotta acknowledge it. We gotta attack it. We gotta say, God, God, listen, we gotta say, God, this is my issue. This is my problem. This is my sin. This is my stronghold. This is the giant that's after me all the time. I think I got it whooped. I confess it and I, I go back to my scene and I pick it back up again. Oh God, I can't deal with this. Guys, I'm gonna tell you something. You gotta come forth and say, God, this is the deal. This is what's happening. This is the sin. And it's me, God. It's me standing in the need of prayer. You got to attack it, attack it, attack it. Let me just say this, though, as a side note. Giants don't start as giants. Did you know that Goliath wasn't always almost 10 feet tall? If he was, poor mama. I mean, I guarantee you he was about a 20-pounder coming out. You know, it's fresh on my mind. I shouldn't have said coming out. But anyway, that's what happens. I don't know, man, I, I, J Goliath was, was probably a 25-pound infant uh, being birthed from his mother, and he probably came out, man, with a sword in his hand. I don't know, I wouldn't have wanted to raise the dude. I mean, he got bigger and bigger and bigger, and he became a giant. It's the same way with us. We allow things to start off small, and we don't catch it. We don't see it because we're not in the Word. We're not spending time with God in prayer. We're not at church every time the doors are open, and we're not as sensitive to these things of the world that are coming against us. Before we know it, we have flirted and flirted and flirted, and the giant from a small thing, it has become a huge thing in our lives. Let me close with this. Let me repeat, because I want you to make sure you get all this. Number one, don't miss the thing that leads to the thing God has for you. We've got to serve before we can do something great for God. David was a gopher before he was a gladiator. Number two, expect critics. People are going to tell you what you can't do, and I'm going to tell you that you've got to have this thing within you that says, I'm going to defeat this giant. Number three, you cannot win by yourself. You've got to have the power of God upon you. Number four, to win, you must attack your giant. Now, here's what I want to park for just a moment, all right? Number five. Finish your giant off. What do you mean? Well, look in verse 51. 
Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. David let the rock fly. Many theologians, most theologians actually believe that it did not, the, the pebble, the stone didn't kill him. It knocked him unconscious. And then, and then David went over because David did not even have his own sword. And then David went over and took the sword out of Goliath's sheath and began to whack away. Yeah, he cut his head off. He was a giant. You think he cut it off in one whack? No, man, there's blood spurting everywhere. It's like a horror movie. <laughs> man, he probably had to whack it and cut it and whack it and cut it. And blood's flowing everywhere. David knew how to get ahead in life. Amen? Y'all catch that? How do you get rid of your giants? You cut their head off. What does that mean? Because if you don't, they're going to come back and they're going to haunt you and haunt you and haunt you. And you're going to have to deal with it over and over and over and over again. Well, I, Pastor, I, I don't believe in violence, Pastor. I, I'm not going to kill my giant. I think that's kind of gross, you know, to just chop its head off and blood flow. I, okay, then, your giant's going to kill you. Kill or be killed. Come on. Kill or be killed. I mean, you got you to gotta finish him off. You got to finish him off. Let me, let me give you an example. Let me give you a few examples, okay, so we can bring this home and, uh, and, and wind this thing down. If you have a problem with alcohol in your life, you say, well, pastor, he said, pastor, I'm, I, you know, I'm praying, I'm praying God will give me strength not to drink anymore. Okay, well, uh, okay, where are you praying from? The bar? But you got to understand, I mean, it's a sports bar. I mean, it's, they have really good peanuts. Guys, listen, when you attack the giant, that means, what I'm saying is when you attack it, you make a decision and you decide, I'm going after this thing. It's not going to rule my life. It's not going to kill me. I'm going to kill it. And then when you finish it off, you know what that means? That means that you got to clear yourself out. You Listen, if you've got a drink, if you've been a, a, a drunk, an alcoholic, and you, you've been addicted to alcohol, guess what? Don't go hang out around alcohol. Don't be dumb. My son-in-law, where's David at? Stand up, David. David is addicted to peanut butter chocolate chip cookies. So if David wants to win this battle, he can't go nowhere where there's peanut butter chocolate chip cookies. Come on, amen? He got to cut his head off. Am I making any sense? Y'all not listening to something. Guys, if you're, listen, if, you, if you've been battling your finances and your account's always overdrawn and your credit cards have gone bonkers, I mean, you, you listen, you're, you've got $5,000 worth of credit limit and you owe them $6,000, there's a problem! Well, I'm just not going to use my credit cards anymore. Okay, well, that's a good way to attack it. But what I'm saying is what you need to do, you got to finish it off. And the way you finish it off is you get away from the temptation. And then what you do is you take your credit cards and you chop them up. Nobody want to hear that, did they? But then I can't go on vacation. No! Cookies, let's see, where else are we going to go with this? Alcohol, addictions, pornography. 
And you got a problem with porn. Guys, you got a problem with pornography? It's good to come to an altar and say, God, 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 here's the deal. God, 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 please forgive me of this. God, and many of you have done this maybe many, many times before. This is your thing, and you have got this problem with pornography, and you've said, God, I mean it, I mean it, I mean it. God, I don't want to do this anymore. But then you go back home, and there's that same laptop. You've been watching it. It's still there. Listen, it may be that you need to borrow this sword of Don Starboards and chop up your laptop. Cut his head off. Well, I need it for work. Yeah, excuses, excuses, right? Rationalize. Well, what about relationships? Man, some of you, boy, some of you have gotten saved in Soul Quest Church. You've given your life to, to God or you're giving your life back to God. And you say, man, I want to live for Jesus. And, and so here you are, but then you're every day. All your friends, here they are, and you're still in this world where you're at church, and man, you, you're wanting to serve God and live for God, but you go back into these relationships where all these people are trying to pull you down, and you don't need to be running with them. Listen, I, I'm not saying you can't have friends that aren't Christians. We need to have friends that aren't Christians so we can win them to Christ, but your best friends should not be uh, non-believers. Your best, 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 best friends, the people that you run with, should that are doing things that, that you don't do, that are against your convictions, you don't need to be running with them because what's going to happen is, and I'm not, listen, don't get this wrong, I'm not saying chop them up. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you got you to gotta sever some relationship. You know why some of you, listen, you're back and forth and you, man, you're living for God one minute and the next minute you're not and you're outside of the will of God and you're, you come to church and you boo-hoo and cry and get under conviction and fall on your face before God. Oh God, I'm sorry. And then the next thing you know, three months later, you're walking in the world again, in the flesh again. Let me tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because most people who do that have gotten back in with the wrong relationships. got to finish your giant off what is it in your life man you got to be willing listen to me you've got to be willing not just to say I don't want to do it anymore not just to say I repent of it I I, I confess it to you God is sin then there's got to be a time when you come before God you come before God and you say God I got to go to a whole nother level I got to go to another level and another level is I got to chop its head off because if I don't it's going to keep coming back. I'm never going to get victory. I'm never going to win. I'm going to fight this battle and fight this battle and fight this battle. Listen, friend, we're going to fight battles the rest of our lives, but you don't have to keep fighting the same one over and over and over again. Cut his head off. Child of God, listen to me. There comes a time. There comes a time. Uh-oh. That ain't what I meant to do. Pick that, somebody pick that up for me. Bring it up here. Set it right here. There comes a time. Thank you, dear brother. There comes a time when we need to make up our minds. That's what we talked about with Daniel. And then we need to attack the giant in our life. I mean, get serious about it. Not play around, not be passive, but be serious. God, I don't want to do this anymore. I repent of it. That word repent means to say the same thing as God. It means, uh, it means to change your mind about it. It means to change your mind. I don't want to do this anymore, God. I want to turn around. But then after that, we have to take further action. When I say chop its head off, what, what, what we're saying is, then you got to take it to a whole nother level. God, I want to, I got to prevent this from happening again. I got to be out of the place of temptation. Some of you today, man, you've battled Addiction after addiction, relationship problems after relationship problems, financial problems after financial. God wants you to have victory. Hear, hear me. God wants you to have victory. And you can have victory. Not in your own power, but in the power of God. But there's got to be some steps that you've got to take. One of those steps is you've got to stand your ground. God, I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I admit it. It's wrong. It's not somebody else's problem. It's not somebody else's fault. It's my fault. It's my sin. It's my giant. 
And then God, I'm going to cut its head off. I'm going to free myself from being in a position where I can give in to it again and again and again. I believe, listen, I believe with all of my heart that God saves us for greater things. But if we're always in that same rut that we've been in forever, we're detouring ourselves. And it's going to be a long time before we get to that thing God really wants us to do. I wonder where you are today. As a Christ follower today, is there something in your life? I mentioned some big things, but maybe it's just anger. Maybe you, maybe you have a hair trigger and you lose control. Maybe it's maybe you're just impatient. Maybe you got a problem with your tongue called gossip. I don't, I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, it's holding you back from doing something great for God. Today, I'm going to ask you not to just find a place at this altar and say, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I confess it, whatever it is in your life. It could be something could be that you've just not, not got into your Bible and spent time with prayer and Bible study. If you don't do that, you're going to give in to a lot of temptations. I, I don't know what it is in your life. Maybe it's, maybe it's bad habits. I, I don't know what it is. But it affects every one of us. And I think that we need to come at our seat or at the altar. I, I, you say, why do you always call people to the altar? I just think there's something special about humbling ourselves before men and God. And bowing before a holy God. Now, you don't have to do that. You can, make, you can make a decision at your seat. But I just think there's something special about coming to an altar. And, and I'm going to ask you today to come to this altar and say, God, here's my giant. I give it to you. I want to attack it. I, I don't want to do it anymore. But then I want you to make a decision. God, I want to cut its head off. I don't want to keep dealing with this. I want to free myself and clear myself from being in positions where I give in to this giant. It's called cutting its head off. Maybe in symbolism of that, you want to walk by as you come to this altar and just touch this sword. And in, in doing so, symbolically, you're saying to God, God, I'm ready to cut its head off. God, I'm ready to win this thing. I'm ready to get, get over this so I can move on with you to the next thing. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody moving except the instrumentalist to come. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Now let me just say this, because if you're here today and you're not a Christ follower, you're not a child of God, you've never been saved, you've never given Jesus your life, I want you to understand something. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, then you'll never have the power to defeat any giant. Now, let me just tell you, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. In other words, he's saying that Christians and non-Christians have issues, have problems, have giants in their life. Things happen in all of our lives. But the great thing about the Christian life is that we have the presence of God inside of us so that when we go through and we battle these things, then Jesus can be our strength and our source, and he battles them for us. We can rely on his strength. If you don't have Jesus in your life, you're at it all by yourself. Guys, I want to ask you, if you're, any of you are here that have never given your life to Jesus Christ, listen, you can do it today. You can ask him to be your Lord and your Savior and your strength and your peace. Would you do it? Wouldn't you like to have him in your life? In your life? The Bible says if we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to ask you, would you, in this holy moment, would you just ask Jesus to save you? I want to lead you in what we call a, a sinner's prayer. We call it that because we're all sinners. We're all messed up. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I want to ask you, would you, would you, would you pray this sinner's prayer in your heart, but pray it to God and mean it? If you'd like to have the presence of God inside of you so that you could win these battles through Christ who strengthens you, would you pray this prayer? If you've never given your life to Jesus, pray this prayer. Say, dear God, pray it. Dear God, I know you love me. 
Jesus, I know you died for me on the cross. I know you rose again the third day. Oh, God, please forgive me of my sins. I turn my back on my sin, and I turn my life to you. Oh, Jesus, on this February 4th, 2018, would you save me? Save me today. I need you in my life. Oh, oh, Jesus, thank you for saving me. I'm going to live for you the best way I know how from this day forward. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one looking around. Can I just ask you, if there's anybody in the house, anyone that just prayed that prayer with me, can I pray for you? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come down front. But if you just prayed that prayer with me just now, I'm going to ask you on the count of three just to lift your hand up high. One, two, three. Hold it up high. Come on, hold it up high. I see that hand. Any others? Come on, I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you so much. Young lady, God bless you. I see these two hands right over here, right over here. God bless you all. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray for each one of these that lifted their hands and those that maybe I didn't even see. Spirit of God, I just pray that you give them boldness today. First of all, Lord, I thank you for saving them. And then I, I ask you to give them boldness. Boldness to stand for you today and to stand for you for the rest of their lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We love you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We had five, maybe six people <laughs> that just passed from death to life, church. Come on, amen. Praise God. Praise God. I want to ask you something. Do you know that just a moment ago when you said yes to Jesus, ma'am, and young, young man, and young person, do you know that when you did that, that the Bible says that all the angels in heaven began to just go a little bit cray-cray? I mean, they just really started worshiping and praising and, 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 and just having a, a good old time because you got saved. Angels in heaven rejoice because of you. Did you, you know that? Man, that's awesome. The Bible says if one person on earth gets saved, the angels in heaven rejoice. You know, we decided uh, when we started this church that we would, are not going to allow the angels to out rejoice us. So I want to ask you, we do this every Sunday. People stand every Sunday. People give their life to Jesus almost every Sunday. And it, it's, it's such a powerful time. It's a, it's a time of, of rejoicing and celebration. I want to ask you, would you allow us to also rejoice with you? Would you allow us to just go a little bit crazy in the house and clap our hands and hoop and holler? Would you do it? If you just prayed and asked Christ to save you, I'm going to ask you, you, on the count of three, not to come down four at front, but I'm going to ask you right where you are to just stand to your feet on the count of three. Would you do it? One, two, three. Stand up. Come on, stand up. Stand up. Who else? Over here, over here. Over here. Anybody else? We want to get y'all some free stuff to help you grow in your faith. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else?